So here's the big question. How do you sell heavy duty parts in a digital world? That's the question. And this is the place where you're going to find the answers. My name is Jamie Irvin, and we are live in five, four, three, two, one. Hello, my name is Jamie Irvin, and we are live here on my LinkedIn profile as well as streaming to a Jamie Irvin YouTube channel. I am really happy to be here today because this is a uh, a moment in time. So if you've been following me on LinkedIn, you know that I am the host of the Heavy Duty Parts Report, right? Oh, oh right there, the Heavy Duty Parts Report. And uh, I've been streaming live heavy duty parts report interviews for some time now, uh, actually 45 weeks straight. We have been producing a live episode on the heavy duty parts report. Recently, as some of you know, I was able to um, get access to LinkedIn live for my business page. So the heavy duty parts report is streaming live now at the heavy duty parts report.com on the Heavy Duty Parts Report LinkedIn page, YouTube channel, and Facebook page. So what this did is this created an opportunity on my personal profile here on LinkedIn to do something a little different. And I have a whole new segment dedicated to answering just one question. How do you sell heavy duty parts in a digital world? We're gonna go live every week. And we're going to go deep on answering this question. So I'm excited about this new segment. It'll be on Thursdays, typically most weeks. Uh, we're going we're gonna to work at it for a while to figure out exactly what the best day is and time. But for right now, we're going to do it on Thursdays. And um, we're really going to tackle this big, big subject and break it down into logical step-by-step subjects that link one to the other and really try to answer this big question because anybody who's in heavy duty can see what's happening. Things are changing. Things are changing really, really fast. And it's got a lot of executives and leadership groups and independent owners who work, especially on the independent service channel and parts channel. It's got them concerned right? Anybody who says they're not concerned is either not paying attention to what's happening in our industry and around the world, or um, maybe they're just uh, not telling us the truth because if they aren't worried, they really should be. I'm not here to spread fear, but really at the end of the day, uh, there's good reason to be concerned because, you know, I, one of the things I hear a lot of executives tell me is they say, we recognize that everything's changing. And so if everything is changing about the way that we go to market and the way that we sell physical products like heavy duty parts in a digital sales channel, aren't we at risk of losing everything we've had and done over the last five decades? Well, that's really how we're going to start off this series by, by examining that one thought. So let's go deep here. Is it a zero sum game? Meaning if we don't transition to a digital sales channel, are we at risk of losing everything? And if we do transition to a digital sales channel, are we at risk of losing everything? And when we look at other industries, we see the dominance of Amazon. And it's not lost on people who understand that uh, Amazon business, their B2B platform, just hit 25 billion in sales. So in the tech space, Google, they won it all. Amazon, they're winning it all in e-commerce, right? They're, they're the dominant companies. Facebook, the dominant social media platform. So over the last 20 years, we've seen these technology companies enter a space and one company wins it all. This has got people really, really concerned, understandably so. Uh, as always with our live, we have an opportunity to uh, have people comment. And so Martin Price, 
Hello, Martin. Good to see you. Martin is a longtime follower of me who um, knows me back when I was doing the Build a Better Business podcast long before I started the Heavy Duty Parts Report. Uh, nice to see you, Martin, and thanks for tuning into our live broadcast. So going back to what we were talking about here, uh, when it comes to these technology companies who have just dominated and they've just owned that space and they've won it all. Uh, people look and they say, well, I sell physical goods. Is Amazon going to come in and just like own the heavy duty part space? And, and does that mean that all the heavy duty parts companies are going to go out of business? You know, are, are they all just like the Sears of uh, uh, to, to their Amazon? Well, it's a really good question, uh, but I think if we go under the surface there a little bit and we look at some history, uh, we can see that, you know, this idea of like one company being dominant is not particularly new. I mean, it's new because those are technology companies, but look at Coca-Cola and Pepsi, right? Coca-Cola owns a huge market share compared to Pepsi. Uh, I believe also if you look at Mercedes-Benz versus BMW. There's a big discrepancy there. And for a long time, many, many decades ago, you know, Ford owned everything when it came to automotive. So having one company being particularly dominant is nothing new. So I don't think that we really need to focus on that. And to be honest, what can any of us do if Amazon decides to put us out of business and turn their attention on our company or our industry? Like, is there something that we can actually do to prevent that from happening? And let's go another layer under the surface and, and look at that fear of, well, if we switch to digital and a digital sales channel, are we going to lose everything we've built up and done in the traditional sales channel? Is it a zero sum game, right? Are we destined to have one company be the only company selling heavy duty parts, putting everybody else out of business? And are we also um, at risk if we do start to change to a digital sales channel at losing something with our traditional sales channel? So let's talk about that next. We just had another comment come in. Uh, this is from, from Dave. He says, I think in heavy duty parts, we may have an advantage in that they're technical and the help of trained parts people will be needed. Not sure how easily tech companies can overcome that obstacle. Dave, you make a really good point. Uh, and I think buying behavior and our customers, when we're trying to service heavy duty parts companies, trying to sell to fleets and repair shops, I think buying behavior is something that we really need to analyze because that buying behavior combined with the physical limitations of the offline world of the fulfillment system are two elements that definitely has kept heavy duty in the game and, and allowed us to remain more traditional for a lot longer than let's say even our cousin over in the automotive sector. But as digital natives start to take over leadership roles, we're going to see a continued push for more technology. And technology companies are working. In fact, there are, I believe that it is not a inaccurate statement to say that there are billions of dollars being spent right now in the trucking industry across all of the different levels to try to bring technology and solve some of the issues related to parts identification, um, predictive maintenance, servicing, and, and, and all of that. So when you put that all together, you know, there, there's an enormous amount, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars being spent on developing that technology. One of the things that I think is really important to remember is we also, as an industry, are up against a demographic issue. We have more people leaving than we have coming in. So some of this technology and some of this digital sales transformation is actually going to help us because the, the ones of us that are a bit younger uh, that are left behind when all of the baby boomers leave in the next decade, we're going to need some help. And so that might actually give us the capacity to better serve our customers. But let's go circle back to buying behavior here. If, if the buying behavior of digital natives who work in repair shops and who take over leadership roles and make these decisions uh, say, if, if that buying behavior starts to align with buying things 
rem- like with your device, your handheld device, right? If, if, if people want that more and more and more and more, which I think the, it's, it's just obvious that, that the younger people do. And even some of us older ones, uh, really love the convenience of that. As long as the parts that show up are right to your point, Dave, as long as they're correct and they're the parts we need and they show up in a timely fashion, there's no reason for the customers uh, to, to not want to continue to go down that road because the more friction there is in the buying journey for the customer, right? The less happy they are. If you remove that friction and you make it as easy as possible for people to buy uh, they're just going to do that. That's why Amazon's so successful. They've got your credit card on file and it's super easy to just buy something and it shows up in a timely fashion. But there's a big difference between me who even lives in a rural area uh, and I buy something and I get it tomorrow, no big deal. Like that's super fast because if I had to go to the city to get it, it's like two hour drive there, two hour drive back, I'd lose like three quarters of a day. So waiting till tomorrow is no big deal. But with commercial vehicles, it's different that truck's got to go, that truck's got to go. So I really believe that right now, there is nothing to lose by investing in the digital sales channel, because it does not mean that we are going to abandon our traditional distribution methods. You know, we still have to physically stock product nearby the customer so that we can get it to them in a timely fashion so down vehicles can go. We still need, to Dave's point, quality parts people who can help identify the parts, especially in the independent channel. And if you look at our cousin in automotive, they have had massive movement forward in in the digital sales channel. And they've got e-commerce companies selling auto parts and, and whatnot. And there's still parts counters out there. There's still independent repair shops like that hasn't changed. And so for commercial trucks, it's just, it's it's even more relevant because of the nature of work trucks versus even a personal vehicle. So I don't think it's justified to, to fear, oh, if I invest in the digital sales channel, I'm going to lose on the traditional side. But I think maybe the root of some of that fear is actually uh, rooted in, well, if people, especially if you're a manufacturer, if people see me marketing directly to the fleets, directly to the end users, my distribution are going to get upset and they're going to, uh, uh, maybe they're going to move to another manufacturer. And I think that's where some of the root of that fear of like, well, what are we going to lose and and certainly for the distributor, one of the fears is, well, if we use technology to identify parts, then do people even need us? And legitimately, if you don't have a value proposition outside of that, then the only value you will have at that point is that you've got inventory on the ground close by the customer. And at best, uh, you could become a fulfillment partner for an e-commerce company that's doing a great job. But again, to Dave's point, I don't think we're going to see the complete removal of parts people and parts counters, because we're still going to have to have questions answered. Uh, A Pew Research study last year showed that 57% of North Americans want to be able, sorry, I shouldn't say that, uh, North American consumers want to be able to go 57% of the way through a buying journey on a complex sale which heavy duty parts is to Dave's point. It's not the easiest thing to identify sometimes what you need, but people want to be able to go 57% of the way through that buying journey. And then they want to be able to contact someone in sales and make sure that the part they're about to purchase with a digital sales channel is the right, the right thing. So whether that's a heavy duty part or buying, you know, a computer, like I just did recently, um, I did all my research online. I watched some videos. I was satisfied. Yep. This is what I want. But then I called in to the sales department to verify that I had the specs correct and it would indeed meet my needs. I had done my research and I was correct. That was the model for me and the, the sale went through. So in the near term, I don't think it's it's really helpful to anyone to view this as a zero sum game. Like we're either going to be all digital or we're going to be all traditional and we can't be both. I think what's the 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 course of wisdom 
is if you want to sell heavy duty parts in a digital world, you have to start going down that road. You have to start investing in the technology that will empower you to do so. That doesn't mean we abandon the tried and true and tested methods of servicing customers, building relationships, and making sure that we take care of their needs. And by the way, even if we were completely digital, we'd still have to focus on those fundamentals. So right now, I think if you're leading a, a heavy duty company and you're trying to make this decision, it's very, very important that you don't look at this as a total zero sum game. Now, in the future, could one company become so dominant that it would put a, a great deal of pressure on all the other companies? Yes, I think that is possible. But that is enough down the road that for right now, I, I don't know that it actually serves us to give that fear any power at all. Because at the end of the day, if we are taking care of our customers and if we are making sure that we sell the way people want to buy, whoever our customers are at whatever point in their, you know, their career they're at, as long as we're focused on that, we have an opportunity to remain competitive. We have an opportunity to service them in a way that's better than our competitors, regardless of what approach they're taking. Steve Hoke just uh, commented. He said, we see this every day on our e-commerce site. Small ticket items are bought on site without interacting, but high ticket items uh, customers look at and then call for more product specs and then come back to the site to purchase. And Steve, that is exactly what uh, any company who is moving into the digital sales channel wants to have happen, right? We want to be able to make that purchasing experience for the customer frictionless. So the best thing I can recommend right now is if you are considering taking the steps like Steve did with his company and incorporating a digital sales channel into your model, the first thing you need to do before you start to get lost in the weeds of the tech and, and, the, and the process and, and the pies data and the ACEs data and all those other issues, I think what's really important is to take a step back and answer a couple fundamental questions. One, why should someone do business with you instead of your competitor? And, and, and here's a little hint answering that question. Don't answer that question with, well, we've got years of experience and we've got quality products and we've got competitive prices and we deliver quickly. Those are barriers to entry into the business that we're in. Those are not differentiating factors. This is a, you know, I, I often say this is a simple question with a hard answer. It takes a lot of real internal reflection. And sometimes it's very difficult to do that on your own. Uh, that's one of the reasons that I work as a consultant, because I can give companies an outside perspective and help them through that process of figuring out what exactly is it that makes us different. And then the second thing I would really strongly encourage you to do is to focus on the friction points that exist currently in the way that you supply parts to your customers. Where's the friction? Where's the issues? Where's the complaints coming from, from your customers? You know, we love to be told that we're doing a good job and that's important, right? Keep doing what's working. But every one of us can do a better job of removing friction points within the buying cycle or the buying journey rather for our customers. So if you start there, if you have a really good understanding of your value proposition and you start to remove friction in the buying journey for your ideal customers, then you have the basis to start to look at how you may incorporate technology to assist you in removing some of those friction points. And if you take that perspective, I don't think there's a lot of fear there. We can actually transform the fear into excitement. Now, this is not easy for a lot of people, I understand. And if you would like to work with me directly, head over to heavydutypartsreport.com slash consultant. There's a landing page there. You can learn a little bit more about what I do and uh, you can book a consultation with me. Thank you for tuning in to this new series where we're going to focus on one question and one question alone. How do you sell heavy duty parts in a digital world? 
I will see you next week. And don't forget to head over to heavydutypartsreport.com tomorrow and tune in to our live interview. Thank you so much for watching. We'll talk to you very, very soon.